I have to be honest with you, uh, in full transparency, I hardly know anything about the sport of cycling, uh, though I find it to be an incredible uh, sport. It seems so awesome. When did you realize that you wanted to be a, a, a cyclist, a professional cyclist? Uh, I think when I was a, a young kid, uh, I had my grandfather. He was a semi-professional rider himself. And... Um, yeah, he inspired me, my brother, my father, and my family to to start cycling. And then, yeah, I mean, cycling is something, you know, super simple in the end. It's two wheels and you, you get forward. And I, I love the simplicity about the, the sport. And, yeah, the, the, you know, we get to travel around the world and to to explore and to, to really see a lot of uh, different things. And I think that's uh, that's really nice. Yeah, it absolutely seems like you're living the dream and you're absolutely phenomenal at it. So you signed a pro contract in 2018, I believe you turned pro in 2019. In that moment, such a big moment in, in your career, how did that feel? Well, it was amazing. I mean, since I started as eight years old, I my dream, my goal was to, to, to become professional and to, ride, to race at the highest level. So, I mean, turning pro in, in 2019 was... Uh, one of the biggest dream coming true. Uh, and yeah, it was an amazing feeling to, to become a professional and to race with your, your idols since that you've been following since you were really small. Yeah. So how did you celebrate that moment? Did you do a back flip? Uh, did, did you, did you flip a wheelie <laughs> on your bicycle? How did you celebrate? Oh, I celebrate with my, with my family. Uh, I, I had a, a nice party when I turned pro and, I mean, it was it was strange because immediately I think I think many athletes can can follow this. Like when you sign your first pro contract, you immediately switch to new goals. So of course you celebrate in the moment, but you you focus on the next goals immediately, which is to to do well as a professional. I mean, I always said, I, maybe it may not be true, but I always said it's easy to become professional. But then to to do well as a professional, that's that's the hard part, and uh, I think that's that's something I focused on uh, immediately when I when I turned pro. So, what was the biggest adjustment that you had to make pre-professional career and into professional career? What was the biggest uh, adjustment you had to make uh, in that transition? I mean, it basically just became a lot easier after I became uh, came into you know a professional team like uh, the Kuning Quickstep where I'm now uh, before you know you're basically as an amateur you organize a lot by yourself um, for everything from traveling to nutrition to training you know you do a lot by yourself or you how do you say you get your own uh, team behind you independently but now when you yeah get pro you you have everything all the the basics around you everything necessary and uh, it, basically in the end it it just makes everything a lot easier for you so you you can do you can focus on what you need to focus on which is just cycling so yeah it's it's a lot easier now <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. So, so with the pandemic, things have been pretty weird. It's impacted everybody in every sport uh, differently. Uh, but as being a pro cyclist, has it been everything that you had kind of hoped it would be? Yeah, I mean, it's been a very, very special year as a, as a professional for, I think, every sportsman or every normal worker out there. I think it's been a very special, special year with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but still, I feel very lucky that, you know, we've been able to, to compete and to, to do our, our competitions and sports, even with the, this pandemic, with, you know, uh, the bubbles that we've been making. And, and it's, it's, been, it's been great, especially for me, because I, just before we, we went into the lockdowns in, in Europe, uh, in the end of February, start March, I, I had a bad crash where I broke. Uh, 10 vertebras so it was how do you say luck uh, luck in let's say bad luck that because that moment I had two two months off uh, the bike and could not do anything uh, but in, those, in this period we also had all the races cancelled and in the end I, I didn't I didn't lose any any races.
man, that sounds, that sounds really painful. How was the recovery been or how was the recovery? Yeah, it was hard. It was a tough period, but I mean, being there on the sofa and, and, and not being able to do anything when you're used to be active all the time, it was, it was a tough period, but I mean, the worst, the worst thing was that you didn't know if you come back to a proper high, high level and that moment in the start I didn't know but when I finally you know found out that I could come back at my the same level as before uh, you started to just you know focus on on the small steps and goals and and to yeah to practice to to re do rehabilitation etc to to come back at the highest level again yeah, well, you are absolutely awesome. I am genuinely very curious. The, the primary sports I cover are mixed martial arts and boxing. So it's obviously completely opposite uh, of cycling. So during a race, what do you kind of do to, to keep yourself at your best? Do you listen to music? Are, are you the type of dude who listens to podcasts while you're racing? Like, what, what do um, you do? Yeah, at races, I mean, we're not allowed to, to listen to any music or podcast. I mean, in, in training, I would do so. But at races, we have this... This radio, team radio, so, I mean, you can compare it to, I don't know, Formula One or other sports, you know, we have this, this, this radio where we have our sports director in the, in the cast behind of the peloton, um, guiding us, uh, I mean, we basically, we mostly use it for, let's say, tactics, but I think more importantly, the the, um, the safety, uh, I mean, we get... The, the, the director behind says if there's some some something dangerous in the front, if we have to turn right or left or the climb coming up, etc. So they they are guiding us through the through the race basically, and uh, yeah, and I mean that's that's almost it. Then then it can also be boring for some sometimes if there's not a lot happening. I mean five six hour, sometimes even seven hours of races are really long. I'm pretty sure my legs would fall off if I had to compete in one of those races. Like my legs would be like all around the bike. <laughs> now, if if you could listen to music while racing, what music would it be? Oh, I like a lot of different kind of music. I mean, from let's say basic old Eminem rap uh, to yeah to even pop or electronic music i mean it's it's really really wide uh, what what i like to listen to or even let's say podcast about cycling or it can be almost everything i mean Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, this is kind of a continuation of what you were saying before, even though I'm, I'm sure while riding five, six, seven hours, it could be boring at times, but I was scrolling through your Instagram and where you're racing, where you're traveling, it is so, fr and I'm sure you can't always take in the moment because you're focused on cycling, but it looks so beautiful. All the different places. I feel like I'd be so distracted while riding my bike the entire time. Yeah, it's it, I, that's what I mean. What I said before, you know, it's I feel so lucky to be able to because we go somewhere and then we we also you know we ride in the outside. I mean, if you're you can be soccer player, you you play in a stadium or, or somewhere something like that. You travel a place, but you don't get to see anything. And I mean, that's what I feel lucky about about our sport is that you're able to to explore and and see things. And normally, you know. Let's say a cycling race somewhere in, even if it's the Tour de France in France, you pass the most important, uh, let's say, towns or monuments in the country because it's also publicity for the country because it's been broadcasted to television. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a, um, you know, a tour around the, a country and seeing the most uh, beautiful or, or great parts of a country. and. Yeah, in, in the you know in the whole season we which normally next year now it's cancelled because of the COVID. But normally we always start the season in Australia. Then you know we have summer races in South America like Colombia or Argentina, and then the rest is more or less in in Europe. But we also have some races in Quebec and Montreal. Uh, but basically, you know, it's more big in in Europe uh, the the world tour of cycling. Yeah, you have traveled uh, around the world. Is there anywhere that you haven't been uh, that you'd like to go to compete? Uh, 
good question yeah i mean i i always wanted to i mean for for cycling i don't know but i always wanted to go to the to the west coast in the us i have only been to to the east coast uh, around philadelphia new york etc but i always wanted to go to the west coast uh and yes i last year or this year in the start of this year i went to colombia which i found amazing as well i mean it was fantastic different different culture and and way to explore colombia i mean i was really really positive surprised um so i i would say somewhere like there or i don't know even even also south africa i, I would really like to go to south africa also because i know the cycling there is it's also getting more and more popular uh, there is even a south african cycling team as well and yeah i think something somewhere some of those places would be very interesting to to see one time yeah absolutely if you ever come down to st louis missouri here in the midwest uh in the united states uh you know maybe we can be and you could teach me how to ride a bike the one time i tried riding sure. a bike i'm pretty sure i nearly took my mom's leg off uh she was she was trying to hold me up and i guess i kicked the pedal too hard and her leg nearly uh, flew off with me so i'm, I'm not too good at it. <laughs> oh you're too strong then yeah that's right yeah <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> there's there's one picture i saw on your instagram and i'm gonna i'm gonna look here i wrote it down paso de los stelvio where you were riding oh. you were riding in the snow in the wet in the ice that seemed very difficult yeah, yeah that, i mean that stage that was during the the giro italia uh two of italy and and that stage there it was i think 18th and it was extremely extremely tough i mean we passed Paso del Estelvio, which is super high mountain uh, here in europe i mean going up to almost 3000 meters now i don't know i think it's about 6000 no even more 7000 feet or something uh <laughs> so super high and and you know in the race we always have helicopters uh following uh for broadcasting and motorbikes, etc. But all these helicopters, I mean, it was a lot of hairpins, so they were just a bit higher than me. And they were flying so low, so they made a lot of vibrations, which caused a kind of an avalanche. So on the on the picture you see, you there's actually, you know, caused from an avalanche that the snow fell down on the on the road. So I mean it was quite spectacular and and, and crazy on the same time, but I mean I came through without getting hurt or anything, so that was that was nice. Yeah, I saw that picture. I had like a, a a little minor heart attack there. It looked very scary. So, what does training look like for you? Training for a season, training for a specific race? Uh, I suppose uh, you could just tell me what a typical training day looks like for you. Oh yeah, I mean now it's quite easy. I say because we just finished the season five six weeks ago, so I had four weeks off uh, off season. And then after four weeks, uh, you start preparing slowly. I mean, even in the four weeks, you know, you stay actively a bit. But in the moment, I'm I'm always going a bit to to the gym to how do you say to get worked on the on the muscle imbalances that you get through the year. Always sitting on the bike and working on the core. Uh, going on the bike, of course, for around I would say by average three to four hours a day. Um, so it's a lot of, you know, it's an endurance sport and in endurance sport, you need all the, the all the hours. So, uh, basically, yeah, tomorrow I'm going for a morning run before breakfast. Then I'm going for three hours on the bike and then, um, you know, doing some specific intervals on the bike, uh, like, uh, some force, uh, slow cadence works and no, it's, at, I would say that's like a normal day on on for me in, in this period i mean and then later on after after christmas uh, when we go on training camps with the team we start preparing more specifically towards our racing program depending if you have uh, starting in, in you know in the classics which are basically more in belgium or northern france or if you're going to let's say doing the the ardens which is also in that area but more short and hilly hilly races or if you're a sprinter perhaps that you're 
going for the flat races. So it's it's quite individual and and different the the training from one to another rider. Yeah, I do have to ask. This is my absolute most favorite question to ask. You obviously are a phenomenal pro cyclist, but if you could be a pro athlete in any other sport, which sport would you would you want that to be and why? Oh. Now you're putting me in trouble. Eh? <laughs> I mean, I never thought about that, actually, to be honest. Good question. What sport would I... I, I played soccer before. I, I went to swimming, handball, which is a popular sport in Denmark. Um, I don't know. I would say something like... Oh, my, my girlfriend, she's a basketball coach. I would love that too, but I would suck at it, I think. But I mean... <laughs> If if I was a pro in another sport, uh, I would say you know what Formula One. I mean, racing cars and I like speed. Like you know, we have speed in the bike, but in cars it's of course uh, very very different. And I think it's it's super super interesting sport to to follow and watch. So um, perhaps a Formula One driver. You know, if if I could choose and uh yeah just like that yeah you know what man for me it would have to be table tennis i have a ping pong table at my house and i have to say i have no athletic ability whatsoever but i'm pretty dang good you know basketball i uh -huh. love basketball uh i one day i for one day I, I devoted an entire day to making half court shots if i made one my dad told me he'd give me a hundred bucks so i'm like I'm, I'm gonna get this out of four i, I calculate this out of 400 shots I made one half court shot, so thank you very much. So you got the money? Yes, I got the money. I got a oh. hundred bucks. <laughs> yes. Ah, may maybe you should maybe you should uh, try to to focus a bit more on um, basketball. It might not be too late, eh? Uh, you, maybe your girlfriend would have to teach me. Uh, I mean, basketball in in Europe compared to the US is a bit different, no? But yeah, for sure, I mean, uh, it would be interesting to. To see a match in the, in the NBA, I mean that's that's uh, that would be also kind of dream. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So handball, soccer, some of those other, and swimming, some of those other sports you had played, have any of those kind of translated uh, into your cycling? Have they, in any like small way, kind of helped you with your cycling? I mean, yeah. For example, this year when I had my my the fractures and my vertebras, I I were able not to to walk a lot or to to bike at all so what i could do i could go swimming because you're you know with less gravity in, in the swimming pool and and in that way i was able to do a lot of rehabilitation and to work on my cardiovascular system to stay a bit in in a good shape so i think like swimming and and even now i'm i'm doing a bit of running you know just to stay active in a different way for also for your mindset as an you know we we go hundreds of kilometers riding every day so i mean staying an active in this period in another way is it's quite important i think and i enjoy like uh, swimming or, or running a lot and i i think that's in the end going to make you a better athlete as well because you know in this in the sports you can be also a bit too too specific especially with cycling yeah, absolutely. I hate running, I'll be honest with you, but it is very good. <laughs> so I do want to touch on this briefly. You were involved in a hit and run in January. Thankfully, you did come out okay. Uh, but you had made a post uh, talking about the need for reform, t taking a deeper look at safety mm -hmm. uh, so everyone can, can, can share the roads peacefully. Uh, talk yeah. about, elaborate on that a little bit for me. Uh, how can we make it safer uh, for cyclists? What needs to happen uh, in order for that to, to occur? Uh, I think, I mean, there are idiots everywhere. Uh, they're idiots, uh, idiot cyclists, idiot drivers, and in the end, I think it's uh, all coming up to to the to the you know lack of respect from each other. And we are always super busy. If it's going to the supermarket or to work, or if you are in the training, you you just want to ride two by two or three by three to talk with your friends. And I think in the end, we just all have to respect each other more. And um, of course, it, it comes on. So, like, let's say the here in Europe, we have a lot of focus on the 1.5 meter rule we have from from drivers to pass the cyclist. And I think that's something really important for for drivers to 
how do you say to follow because i mean when you're sitting in the car even myself you know you get easily you 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 would pass somebody quite near but if let's say the driver try to sit on the bike because i mean 90 percent of the people maybe they didn't sit on the bike and and when they feel someone passing it's it's super scary and i think yeah if if people would just you know respect each other more on the roads i mean the roads are my office for for my training uh there that's my work so i always try to respect the drivers as much as possible and then there are so always some people perhaps ruin, ruining the image of cyclists and and that's why i mean some drivers they have those experiences and then they are pissed off and then they want to show they are bigger or more important and and in the end as a cyclist the only thing you can do is to be careful because we are the most the weakest one in in the on the roads and 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 yeah i mean now luckily i think people are starting to talk more about it um but we are still seeing a lot of uh, very, very bad accidents every year um, from professional cyclists to all amateur cyclists. And yeah, I think cycling is the only sport in the last, let's say, 30 years that's only become more more dangerous. I mean, we have better material, faster material. Uh, of course, okay, the helmets are getting better, but all other kind of security is only getting we're dry, riding the bikes faster so it's only getting more dangerous and um yeah now i saw a nice thing like you can have these kind of lights cameras or uh, lights uh, with a camera integrated i mean like some cars have a camera integrated recording if you have an accident i think that would be quite quite uh, helpful also for cyclists because then you would be able to prove and see how the incident happened. Like in my case in January, I was by a hit and run and I was unconscious. So I did not know or remember anything of who or what happened. And, and I was quite bad. And luckily a woman, uh, another female cyclist, she, she found me there on the road and, you know, and, and took me off the side of the road and, and helped me. But I mean, this is also, of course, something yeah, I'm. You know, just even if an accident happened, you know, why would you escape away? And I think, yeah, accidents always happen, but you have, we have to respect and and help each other more on, on the roads. It's it's not mine. It's not someone else's. It's all of us. So I think that's important. Yeah. Well, first, I'm glad you're okay. And second, respect is something applicable in this situation and in life in general. I think this world needs a lot more respect and we need to respect each other a lot more. Mikel, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you. I can't wait to chat again. Uh, I'm going to leave the floor to you. Anyone you'd like to thank, your team, sponsors, all that good stuff. Uh, and how can people find you on social media? Oh, yeah. Um, thanking people. I mean, thanking everybody. I'd rather not name anybody because I would miss somebody for sure. Um, I'm very thankful uh, yeah, for, for all the people near me, helping me and my, my team, my family. Um, and, and yeah, you can follow me on, on Instagram. My name is Michael Honore and uh, on Facebook as well, you will be able to find me or on Twitter. So that's my main social media. And uh, thanks for having me and hope to talk and see you another time.